The UFC Paris card just finishing. It was actually a really, really good card. We had a lot of finishes on that main card. We had some crazy, crazy upsets. And we had a disgusting robbery. And we're going to get into all of it. We're going to break down all of it. We're going to talk about all of it. We're going to talk about all of the biggest talking points after that UFC Paris event. But before we get into it, make sure to like, sub, all that YouTube shit. It truly, truly does help me out a ton. Your one like push it out to 100 more people with the click of a button. And also make sure to subscribe because only like 25% of the people that watch my videos are actually subscribed. I also want to say thank you to all the boys for showing up and showing and love inside the watch party. The watch parties are always so, so, so much fun. All the boys chilling in there, talking about fights, talking about our hate for the French. It was super, super fun. So I appreciate all the boys that came through. Let's get right into it though. Starting off, we are going to start off with the co-main event. The co-main event, first off, I thought it should have been the main event. I think Nasruddin Imamov versus Brendan Allen, it just makes so much sense for that to be a five-round fight over Benoit St. Denis against Renato Moicano. If Benoit St. Denis and Renato Moicano actually got into that fourth or that fifth round, it could have just looked like a sloppy striking fest, you know what I mean? It wouldn't have been a great fight. But after that, you know, three rounds of Nasruddin, Imamov and Brendan Allen, I was kind of clamoring for more. We didn't really get to see, like, who the better guy was. I feel like we didn't really get a full grasp of who either guy was or who either guy is at 185 or, you know, like, is one that much better than the other? Because Brendan Allen dominated the first round. It was a really, really good first round, dominated the first round. Second round was the opposite. Nasty and Imamov managed to, you know, kind of stuff a lot more of those shots, do good work on the ground and on the feet. He was kind of piecing them up. The third round, I thought, was really, really close. I'm not going to go as far to say robbery because I think it's just a close fight. A lot of these fights that people are saying robbery, robbery, robbery. I think that was just a close fight. I personally gave it to Brendan Allen. I thought Brendan Allen did just enough, but I can see it go either way. It was 50-50 for me either way. Could have been 29-28 Imavov and could have been 29-28 Brendan Allen. I don't really have any problems with the decision. My big thing is though, Imavov isn't really a threat to 185. Like I don't see either of these guys being an actual threat. When we look at Nasruddin Imamov, if you think about him against the guys that are higher than him in the division, because he does have good wins. He's beat Jared Cannonier. He's beat Brett. He's beat Jared Cannonier. He's beat Brendan Allen. He has beat really, really good guys at that division. But does anybody see him as a threat to DDP? Does anybody see him as a threat to Sean Strickland, to Robert Whitaker? I even think that Hamza Chamaev would give Nasruddin Imamov a lot of problems, especially if Brendan Allen can do what he did. If Brendan Allen can, you know, take your back, if Brendan Allen can get to really, really dominant and advanced positions early, I think that Hamza Chamaev probably submits him. So I don't actually see him as a threat when he should be, considering the wins that he has, considering, you know, where he's at in the division right now, he's probably going to be the number three guy in the division by the time of the rankings update. I haven't really seen too much to impress me. I haven't seen too much where I look at him as... He's the future guy at 185. So I don't really see him as a threat. And then for Brendan Allen. Brendan Allen lost this fight. His stock doesn't go down too much for me. I think it was a close fight. I think it was a pretty even fight. But I see one big problem in his game. And it's something that you see with kind of these like top five, top 10 fighters, but not with the champions, not with the top three guys. And it's that for me, he's a little bit too rigid. He's a little bit too rigid. And what I mean by that is when a coach says to you and you have a game plan going into your fight and you're looking at the film and the coach says, every time he moves right, shoot for a double leg. Every time he moves right, you know, shoot for this single leg. Every time that he, you know, jumps over to his left a little bit, that's when you have to do this. And he went in there and he followed that game plan. But he followed that game plan too much. You need to be able to look and, you know, kind of decipher for yourself on the spot and go, okay, this isn't working. The takedown isn't working. Like this single leg isn't working. So I'm not just going to go back to it over and over and over and over again. And that's what Brendan Allen did. The first round, he got the takedown pretty early. He was, you know, able to really, really dominate him on the ground. And it was a fantastic first round. But you have to be able to adjust. You have to be able to go, okay, now he knows the takedown is coming. What am I going to do now? And he couldn't really do that. He was still, you know, jumping on shots in that third round at the end of that second round that he had no hope of getting, that he had no business getting any of those shots. So you kind of look at him and you're like, we need to see you be able to do something on the fly. Like with all the great champions that we see where this is the game plan, but all of a sudden the game plan has to change. All of a sudden this isn't working, he's figured this out, and it's a chess match. The takedowns work in round one, they're not going to work in round two. Now we know that they're not working in round two, we've got to change it up for round three. So I think that Brendan Allen was just a little bit too rigid, and I want to see him switch it up a little bit in the future, but this fight, for being a fight that I was super excited, I was like, this will tell us who the future 185 is. I didn't really get that feeling. I didn't really get that someone had a really, really dominant performance or someone is levels above the other one and the future of the division. After that, we have Joanna Sambrito. Joanna Sambrito, I've talked about him a ton. 
one of my top prospects inside the UFC, a guy that I think is going to be, you know, like one of the future guys that 145 pound division. And he got robbed. He got robbed badly. I rarely, rarely ever say the fights are robberies. And that's how you know that if I say that it's a robbery, because there's a lot of people that will just go robbery, 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 robbery. But I truly do believe that this is a robbery. I cannot see how William Gomes wins that round three. I just can't see how he wins that round three. The round one is pretty close. Don't get me wrong. The round one is pretty close. The round two is the most obvious Joanna Sombrito round of all time. Like there's not even a debate that round two could go anywhere but Joanna Sombrito. But round three... I can't see it. I can't. I just don't understand how William Gomez ended up with that decision. It doesn't make any sense to me. I personally scored it as 30-27, Jonathan Brito. I thought that William Gomez, there's some close rounds in there, but he wasn't able to win a round. And I almost feel bad for William Gomez. Yes, he gets the win, and it's a great win against Jonathan Brito. But he's almost just lambed the slaughter at 145 now. Who are they going to give him next? Because Jordan Zimbrito was like the 16th, the 17th guy in that division. He was someone that was super, super close to the rankings. So now, by you know that logic, William Gummies has to be ranked. And if he's in the rankings, who are you giving him? You're giving him Jean Silva at 145? No. You're giving him Josh Emmett at 145? Like anybody in the rankings at 145 is a mismatch for him. It's a mismatch for him. And I don't feel bad for him because he did rob my boy, Joanna Sombrito. So I don't feel too bad, but he's just going to get cooked. He's not at that level. He's not at that level to be in the rankings at 145 yet. But saying all that, Joanna Sombrito, I do believe got robbed. I do believe 100% that he got robbed. But it's almost his own fault. He didn't look good at all in this fight. He didn't look good at all. He did win the fight, but uh, don't get me wrong. He won the fight, but he didn't look good. His striking looked a little bit off. He looked like he was just kind of swinging at shadows in the striking. The grappling looked good. But I wanted to see him take more advantage of the grappling. Once again, you find out that something works in round two and you don't try go back to it at all. I understand that he's going to have just it a little bit, but the wrestling worked super well for you and you don't try go back to the wrestling. You don't shoot another shot for the rest of the fight. I don't really understand that. He has good power, Jonathan Brady. We all know he has elite KO power, but I don't want him to fall in love with his hands. He is a mixed martial artist. That's why I liked him a ton. That's what we saw when he beat Diego Lopez. He's able to grapple with the best grapplers. He's able to strike with some really, really good strikers. I want to see you use all of mixed martial arts. Don't just fall in love with, hey, listen, I'm going to knock this guy out. I'm going to throw bombs. And if I clip him, he's going to go to sleep. Because that wasn't the game plan there. That wasn't what was working. So Adriano Sombrito did get robbed. 100% he won that fight. But he also didn't look great. He also didn't, he didn't look like the Joanna Sombrito that I thought was going to show up there. After that, we have Brian Battle. Brian Battle, I think he's going to be a cult hero. I think that Brian Battle is actually going to be a cult hero at 170. Me and him have the same views on France. When I see somebody that's anti-France, when I see someone with anti-France propaganda, you're immediately a guy that I'm rooting for. You're immediately on my good side. And Brian Battle is immediately on my good side. He's unlucky that he ended up at 170. Because I think if he's at 55, if he's at, you know, 205, I think that he's a possible contender. I think that he's possibly a top five guy, even maybe a future champion. But he's at 170. 170, once again, it seems that every single good prospect that we have just ends up in this fucking division. Brian Battle would be a top prospect in another division. At 170, he's probably not a top five prospect. Like you look at Carlos Bradis, you look at Michael Morales, you look at all of these different guys at 170 that are all super young, that are all on the come up, that are all going to be great fighters for the future. Brian Battle is just another name at 170. So I feel a bit bad for him that he's, you know, dropped into this division, that that's the division that he's at right now, just one of the most stacked divisions in the UFC. But I still think that he's going to be one of those guys that's a fan favorite. They're in every single division. You know, you have Bobby Green at 155. There's guys that may not be the greatest fighters ever. He may never get a UFC championship. But I think that he will be loved and adored by UFC fans for the future. And the new look is good. I'm fucking with the new look. I'm fucking with the, you know, channeling his inner Charles Oliveira. So Brian Battle, he is unlucky, but he's someone that I'm definitely excited to watch in the future. Like, everybody should be tuned in for Brian Battle fights now. After that, we go all the way back to the early prelims, all the way back to the first fight on the card. And another guy who I thought was good, another guy who I watched on Dana White Contender Series, and I went, this guy's got something to him, Balaji Oki. Balaji Oki just hasn't looked great inside the UFC. I'll be honest with you. The first fight that he won on a fight night won via decision. Didn't like it. Didn't like it. Didn't think that he looked good. Didn't look good in this fight either. Just did not look good in this fight either. And the things that I liked him for was his ability to stand on the feet, his body punching, because I feel like it's super, super underutilized in MMA, and only really the best guys do it. Like, you look at Sean Strickland does it a lot, Max Holloway does it a lot. I think it's something that's very, very underutilized, and Balaji Oki was fantastic at that. But he just didn't 
fight well. He just like he just wasn't good today, and he's not who I thought he was. In both fights we've seen now, in the first fight I thought, you know what, it's you know the jitters of your first fight inside the UFC. It's in the apex. It's a different scene to what you're used to. I'll get over it. But he did not look good today, and he has one more fight before you're looking at him like. Where does he line up inside the UFC? Is he a cut candidate? Because he's not bringing in any fans either. After that, we have more talking about the entire UFC event overall. And this is why the UFC needs to go global. This is why the UFC needs to have less fight nights in the Apex. I don't want them to build out the Apex and build it into a stadium. Every single fight night should be, you know, you should go Ireland, England, Argentina, China, France, you know, all of these different places. You can tour, obviously, around in America. You can go to, like, St. Louis. You can keep all of those ones. But I don't want to see the same location over and over and over and over and over again because we saw how electric the crowd was today. France doesn't get that many MMA events. France doesn't get that many UFC events. England doesn't. Ireland doesn't. Like, all of these countries, obviously, if you put one over in China or in Asia, they don't get that many events. The crowd is going to be popping. The crowd is always going to be really, really, really good for these events. So why doesn't the UFC go global more often? Because you can't have that Brian Battle promo where he's talking shit to all of the French. You can't have that Renato Moicano promo if you're in the Apex with no crowd or if you're in the US. Like, nobody's really going to give a fuck. Nobody's really going to, you know, get annoyed by it or get really, really hyped up for it. But it's because they're in France. It's what creates these viral moments. It's what creates Brian Battle and Renato Moicano as the fan favorite, almost like star-like figures that they are inside the UFC today. So the UFC needs to continue to glow global and get the fuck out of the apex. And the main card today was elite. I always say sometimes, you know, some main cards are bad, some cards are good. And I'll always give the shout out to the main card when the main card is fire. Loads of finishes, upsets, controversy. There was a bit of everything on this main card. So shout out to France, putting putting together an elite crowd and an elite main card. I still hate the people and I hate the judges, but you know, I'll give them their plaudits where, where it's due. Then we go on to the main event. The main event was Renato Moicano against Benoit St. Denis. I'll be real. I was going into this. I'm pretty sure everybody was going into this thinking, this is a step up for Moicano. This might be a step too far because Benoit St. Denis, don't forget, Benoit St. Denis was one fight away from a title fight. One fight away from a title fight. If he beats Dustin Poirier, where he had Dustin Poirier on the ropes in round one and at the start of round two, he gets that title shot against Islam Makachev and now he couldn't look further away from a title shot. So I kind of go into it thinking, this might be a step too far for Renato Moicano. But he proves everybody wrong and he proves everybody wrong again. Come back against Jalen Turner. His last fight at UFC 300 looked really, really good here. And I knew that his jiu-jitsu was good. I knew that his wrestling was good. I knew that his grappling was good. The thing that surprised me a lot about Moicano is how good his jab is. And that might sound kind of strange, but Moicano actually has an elite jab. And especially if you can cut people open like he did to Benoit St. Denis, you don't need the shoot shot to reopen that cutting round too. That jab just reopens it, makes it worse. It's kind of that, you know, like death by a thousand cuts type of thing where once that cut got opened, he just used his jab over and over and over and over and over again. And eventually it was to the point where fucking Benoit St. Denis could not see out of that eye. And I knew that that fight was going to get stopped. I don't mind the stoppage. I think, you know, it's a decent stoppage. It's a fine stoppage. I always feel a little bit bad for a guy like Benoit St. Denis in his home country that he doesn't get to go out on a shield and that he has to, you know, go out via doctor stoppage. But I don't mind the stoppage. And Renato Moicano could be a threat at 155. Could actually be a threat at 155. Him versus Paddy could be a huge fight too. That could be a huge fight. That could be a fight that like people are super, super excited for. I kind of don't want him to take that fight. Not because I think that he'll lose it, but because I think it's a downgrade. I'd like to see him say, Paddy, win another fight. Take another fight, win another fight, and then we can think about it. Because I kind of want to see him go up the rankings rather than down the rankings. But if Paddy gets another win, that could be a huge fight. That could be a major, major fight. Morcano, Paddy Pimblet. And that's a 50 50 pick em fight, too. That is a pick em fight. So I'd be excited for that one if it was to happen. But I need Paddy to get one more fight because Morcano is going to be maybe seventh, eighth, ninth in the rankings now. And Paddy's at 15th. So that would be a jump for Paddy to take. Then finally, we have Faraz ZM. Faraz ZM, I want to talk about him a little because prospects are far and few in between at 155 and good prospects. And he actually looked really good in this fight. He looked like he could, you know, grapple with Matt Favola. Also, for Matt Favola, can we just get the guy a fucking winnable fight? You give him Benoit St. Denis and then you give him Faraz ZM. Like, can we get the guy a fight where he's not going to get brutally KO'd? Because that's back-to-back ones where you look at Matt Favola and you're like, ooh. Damn, that KO was nasty. The head kick KO by Benoit Saint-Denis. And now this one, this knee straight to the dome. 
I feel bad for Matt Provola, but for SEMs, actually someone to watch out for. He's someone to watch out for at 155. I'm tuned in for his next fight and I'd like to see him get a step up in competition. I want to see where he is at 155, whether it's, you know, against a Bobby Green, a Paddy Pimblett or something like that that's kind of just in and around those rankings. I want to see for SEM get tested. I want to see him against the legit, legit UFC fighter to see where he is. But that is the biggest talking points after UFC Paris. Make sure to like, sub, the YouTube channel. I'll catch you with tomorrow. Peace.